Hi everyone, so here is the simple harmonic motion equation d2f by dx squared is minus k squared f where f is a function of x and k is a constant. So if you're reasonably familiar with physics you can probably immediately write down the solution to this equation because it just turns up so frequently. Uh, but what we're going to do in this video is solve it in a slightly unconventional way and pretend that we don't know the solution is a combination of sines and cosines. Um, try solving it using a polynomial instead. So what I mean by that is we're going to let our function f um, be a sum of powers of x. There's going to be a sum of um, some power of x, x to the i. Uh, my sum is going to run from i values from 0 up to infinity, so we're including all possible uh, powers of x, and each um, power of x is weighted by some coefficient, which I'm going to call c subscript i. All right. So we're going to differentiate this polynomial twice so that we can substitute it into the original equation. Uh, so if f has that form, then what's going to happen to df by dx? Well, first thing to note is the first term is going to disappear because the first term, if we were to expand this sum, the first term would have x to the power of 0, which is a constant. Um, and so what I can do when I differentiate it is change the indices so that i now starts from 1 instead of 0, right? because the 0 term just disappeared. Um, and then if we just differentiate x to the i, you get i um, times x to the i minus 1, and we've still got our coefficient um, ci there. So then let's repeat that again, differentiate it to, to get d2f by dx squared. Uh, Similarly, the first term will again disappear because the first term has i equals 1, and so that's proportional to x to the 0. It's a constant, so it'll disappear. So now our sum is going to start from i equals 2. So it's sum from i is 2 to infinity. Uh, you'll pull down a factor of i minus 1. Uh, still got your uh, coefficient there, but your power is now going to be i minus 2. So here's the expression for our second derivative of x. So before we substitute this into the original equation to see what happens, I want to do one more thing, which uh, is relabeling the indices so that they again start from zero. And so if you think about it, um, let me let me first write out the sum. So I'm going to say, OK, we want our i to actually start from zero. Um, now, the first value of i in the previous line is two. And so that i there, the first value that this i takes is two. If I want to start my indices from zero instead, that means the i that I've, you know, put that arrow uh, towards has to be replaced with i plus 2. Okay. Um, similarly, well, because basically because I've replaced that i with an i plus 2, I have to replace i with i plus 2 uh, everywhere in this equation, right? I'm basically making a transformation of variables from uh, i to i plus 2. So this i minus 1 here is going to become i plus 2 minus 1, which is i plus 1. Um, then we get c i plus 2, right, the coefficient of uh, x to the i plus 2, and our power is going to be i plus 2 minus 2, which is just i. Okay, uh, so we've relabeled our indices. Um, you might want to uh, pause and just write out the first couple of terms of this sum, or, or these last two lines, just to convince yourself that you uh, do indeed get the same thing. Anyway, so the reason for doing that is because we're going to substitute this back into the original equation along with our polynomial for, for f, right? So to make a direct comparison between the two sides of the original equation, um, it would be helpful if the, the indices sort of matched up. So let's do that substitution. Um, in fact, I can just do some copying and pasting. So this entire expression, which is d2f by dx squared, is supposed to be equal to minus k squared uh, times this expression up here for our function f, right? So I'm just substituting d to f by dx squared and f into our SHM equation. <laughs> and then what you can do, because uh, the different powers of x are line linearly independent from each other, you can just compare the coefficients of each power, right? This is why it was useful to rewrite the indices um, so that they both go from zero to infinity, because you can just compare the coefficients of x to the power of i, right? So for the left-hand side to equal the right-hand side for any value of x, the coefficients have to be the same as well. So we can equate uh, i plus 2 times i plus 1 times c subscript i plus 2 with minus k squared 
uh, times ci, right? Because this k squared is a constant, so I can just put it uh, inside the sum on the right-hand side. So this is it's a recurrence relation um, between ci plus t and ci, right? So what I mean by that is you can rearrange the equation to get ci plus 2 is minus k squared ci divided by uh, i plus 2 i plus 1. <laughs> so if you know ci, then this equation automatically determines ci plus 2. So let's consider some specific values of i um, and see what happens. So the, the first value of i that appears in our sums down there is 0. And so if you call the first coefficient, the coefficient of x is 0, c0, then you can write c2 in terms of c0, and then you can write c4 in terms of c2, and c6 in terms of c4, and so on. So let's just go through uh, the first few um, terms and, and see what happens. Right? So <clears throat> we're going to get c2, just by considering the case where i is 0, it's going to be minus k squared c0, um, over 2 times 1, right? Because that term would just be 2, that term would be 1, which is just 2, but for reasons that will become clear just now, I'm going to write it as 2 factorial, right? Because it's the same thing, it's just 2 times 1. Um, what about C4? Because right? if you know C2, then you automatically know C4 um, as well. So using that recurrence relation up there, you're going to get minus k squared C2. Um, but now i is equal to 2, so this is 4 and this is 3. So you get 4 times 3, which is not quite a factorial because it doesn't go all the way down to 1. But then you know c2 in terms of c0, so you can take that first expression and substitute it into our expressions for c4, right? <clears throat> and so what that's going to do um, is give us k to the power of 4, because we've got k squared times k squared, and the minus signs cancel. Um, and now we've got c0 up at the top there. And when you multiply the denominators, you get 4 times 3 times 2 factorial, right? Which is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 4 factorial, right? And so uh, you might sort of spot the pattern that's emerging already, but let's just do one more term uh, just, just in case. So this, uh, the c6, right, coefficient of x to the power of 6 is going to be minus k squared c4. Um, on the denominator from the recurrence relation, we are going to get 6 times 5. So 6 times 5, but then again, we can take our expression for C4 from the previous line, sub it in to the numerator there, um, and you're going to get minus k to the power of 6 uh, times C0 divided by 6 times 5 times 4 factorial, which is 6 factorial, right? So there's this sort of pattern emerging in the coefficients of the even powers of x, right? Um, so I'm just going to put dot 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 to show that, you know, you can continue that pattern for C8 and C10, um, and so on. Uh, right, so now we're in a position to write down at least part of our function f of x, right? So if you know C0, uh, well basically your, your very first term is going to be C0, okay, because that's the coefficient of x to the 0. Um, I'm going to start a pair of brackets here. And I'm going to factor out that c0, right? So here I've just got c0 times 1, which is which is c0, right? That's just the first term. What about the second term? Well, it's going to be uh, plus c2 times x squared, but we know c2 in terms of c0. Uh, so I can write this as minus k squared over 2 factorial um, times x squared, right? And I already factored out that c0, so I don't have to put the c0 in the numerator there. Um, <clears throat> right, and then I can similarly put here k to the 4 um, times x to the 4 divided by 4 factorial, and then we get minus k to the 6 over 6 factorial times x to the 6, and so on, right? And you get this uh, infinite power series um, for x. Uh, all right, so what about the odd terms, though? So far, we've only talked about the even powers of x, because uh, that's how this recurrence relation at the top here works, right? If you know C0, you know C2 and 4 and 6 and so on. But that doesn't tell you anything about C1, 3, 5. So essentially, the odd powers of x are completely independent from the even powers of x uh, for this particular solution. But you could go through uh, the same process that we did for the even powers and find you could use your recurrence relation uh, up at the top here to find C3 in terms of C1 
and then C5 in terms of three C3, and hence in terms of C1 and so on. And you'd get all of your odd powers in terms of C1. And we can pretty much just go straight to writing down those terms in our f of x down here. You can factor out a C1. The first odd power you get, first odd power term you get would be C1 times x. So we just put an x there. Um, in exactly the same way as we got this expression for t C2 up there, uh, your next odd power of x is going to be x cubed. Your coefficient C3 is going to be minus k squared over... 3 factorial, right, because um, basically when you, your, your first value of i is now going to be 1 instead of 2, so you get 3 times 2 instead of 2 times 1, right, so uh, that the next term here is going to be minus k squared x uh, cubed divided by 3 factorial, and then again the powers would alternate, you would get plus k to the power of 4 times x to the power of 5 over 5 factorial, and then you get minus the x to the 7 term, and so on. Okay, now one thing that might look a little bit strange here is that for the even powers, uh, the, the order of k and x sort of always matches up in each term, so you've got 2, 2 as your powers there, 4, 4, and so on. Whereas for the odd powers of x, you've got uh, k squared, but then x cubed, k to the 4, um, x to the 5 and so on. So we might be tempted to try and sort of fix that and make the powers of k and x um, always match up. And you could in fact do that by taking out a factor of 1 over k in front of that second bracket. Um, so if we do that, instead of c1, we're going to put c1 over k. Then all of the terms in the bracket have to be multiplied by k to keep it the same. All right. So this x is going to become kx. My k squared in this term has to become k cubed my k to the 4 in the next term has to become k to the power of 5, and so on. All right. Uh, so now we've just made it look a little bit nicer by matching up the orders of the k's and the x's. Um, at this point, we've actually derived our solution. Remember, k is just a constant. c0 and c1, we don't know, and it's not possible to get values for those without further information. Essentially, you would need boundary conditions or initial conditions um, in order to determine those, right? As we we always do, we, you need two boundary conditions um, if you're trying to solve a second order differential equation. So it makes sense that you have these free parameters, C0 and C1, which independently determine all of the uh, even powers and all of the odd powers. Um, now, if you are familiar with uh, Taylor series, you'll probably recognize both of these. And in fact, this infinite power series of x's um, in our first set of brackets is just the power series for cos of kx, right? So I'm not going to attempt to derive that in this video, um, but we'll take that as a, as a sort of given, and we can rewrite that first set of brackets as c naught times cos uh, of kx. And similarly, the second set of brackets, the stuff in the second set of brackets is just sine of kx, right? All of those odd powers. So I can write plus c1 over k times sine of kx, and it looks a little bit strange to have you know, this divided by k here. Remember that k and c1 are just constants anyway, so that we could just combine them into a single constant to make it look a little bit nicer. Let's relabel c0 as just a, so you get a cos of kx. Um, and let's relabel c1 over k as just uh, some new constant b. So a cos of kx plus b sine of kx. Um, so we were indeed able to uh, recover the well-known solution to the SHM equation using polynomials.